Good afternoon and welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. We are resuming uh, the consideration of um, the second periodic report of Kuwait. And uh, this is the 2842nd meeting of the committee. Your Excellency, I hope uh, your delegation has had enough time now to, uh, to prepare the responses that uh, members of the committee expected and uh, which, for reasons of time, you could only supply in very, very brief form. Now you have more time. As I indicated, we are willing to give you something like an hour. If you can, if you... Uh, want to yes. uh, um, expand on some of the east of the responses. But let me also explain that members of the committee, even though they uh, submitted a list of issues, they may want to ask further questions in addition to what is in the written list. So the questions are not set in stone. They can vary depending on whatever clarifications, whatever further information members of the committee want. Yeah. So with that, I uh, give you the floor and uh, we are at your disposal. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I would like to express my appreciation to you and to the members of the committee by giving us uh, this one hour to explain further our positions concerning the different questions raised by uh, distinguished experts. I will start with uh, trying to answer yeah. Uh, ask uh, the question number 19 concerning the obligatory military service and uh, the question raised by colleagues. Uh, please, uh, Dr. Hude. Shukran, Siyat al Rais, Shukran, Siyat al Sefir. As far as the military, uh, obligatory military service is concerned, the question uh, posed by the committee clarification about the draft uh, law, which has been sent uh, to the parliament. Uh, and this is the national military service. Uh, this uh, draft was sent to the parliament. Uh, and uh, we took into consideration in this draft uh, all uh, the uh, errors or, or uh, shortcomings uh, of the current uh, law. The national military uh, law uh, uh, are in line with uh, what is uh, in the Constitution uh, in uh, Article 46, uh, that uh, the defense of the country is a sacred duty, and that it is an honor for and the Article 156, uh, 57 also states uh, that uh, the, uh, the security of the, uh, of the state is the responsibility of every citizen. And uh, Article 158 states uh, that uh, the uh, the national military law, the uh, draft uh, law, is con con composed of uh, 89 articles, which cannot uh, explain uh, these articles. But I can uh, concentrate uh, on the most important of these articles uh, in the law. I would like, first of all, to say that uh, Article 86, six, 68 uh, of the, the Constitution, that uh, the, uh, the, uh, they can participate uh, in, the, the, in a war of defense uh, as to a war of attack, uh, this is uh, not uh, permissible. And uh, we should uh, pre prepare a draft law for this purpose is to for the defense of the country. The draft law also constitutes 
is composed of a number of articles, Article 5, which provides the ministry, Minister of Defense the right to issue a decree of the places and how the national military service is carried out, and also that uh, those who carry out uh, this uh, uh, field can also work in the military hospital and according to their uh, specializations uh, in this law. In spite uh, of the fact that most legi military legislation in modern countries uh, are strict and uh, comprise uh, heavy penalties uh, for those who do not present themselves for the national military service, nevertheless, this uh, draft uh, law constitutes, uh, has also an Article 16, which says uh, that uh, people can be uh, excused from this service uh, if they are uh, sick or if it is an only son or and and other uh, purpose other reasons uh, for uh, such exemption the uh, oh, the law also comprises the possibility of delaying the national military service uh, for the graduates of universities and institutes uh, until they get they can get a job and also to delay those who are uh, uh, oh, uh, those who are uh, go with their wives abroad for studies and uh, therefore the uh, their service is uh, postponed until further notice or until they return and also we can uh, postpone uh, the uh, service uh, for somebody who has uh, a small business uh, who's, uh, uh, who has only operated for less than five years. I would like to say that uh, this uh, legislation of the National Military Service does not uh, usurp the rights of uh, the citizens. Uh, this uh, law, the object of this law is to qualify uh, Kuwaiti youth militarily in order to defend uh, the country and to defend its sovereignty. This uh, law, we took into consideration when drawing it up, all the various uh, components uh, of the society to so that they may benefit from the law. As far as the Thimania min al uh, the, uh, those who object for conscience reasons, they can carry out uh, other uh, work, and it is uh, not uh, any uh, kind of service uh, of uh, of a military nature. And also for the countries uh, which uh, which uh, accept uh, the uh, uh, conscientious objector, that is person, uh, they are. Is uh, late countries whose laws uh, can, which uh, provides uh, the the leeway for uh, con uh, con objections uh, of conscience uh, to carry out some civilian uh, uh, service uh, instead of uh, military uh, instead of military service. Uh, this is the law A two. The uh, national military service law does not. This. this uh, reason, but it takes uh, into consideration many other uh, uh, facts uh, of uh, the, the desires of uh, the citizens in order to carry out uh, this uh, national military service. Uh, it is an honor to the citizen uh, to carry out this work. As far as the second uh, part is concerned, uh, children, the employment uh, labor law Uh, the National Military Service uh, starts at age 18 to age 35. There is no military service for children. 
below 18. And uh, they can also carry out, uh, in accordance to uh, Article 19 of the Labour Law, and the, it uh, prohibits uh, the employment uh, of those who are below 15 years of age. Also, children are not, uh, are, they are prohibited from either doing military service or from doing any other kind of labor. For beggars, Kuwait has no beggars. In fact, uh, Kuwait prohibits uh, begging and considers it uh, that it is contrary to the uh, traditions and the civilization of the country. Uh, uh, beggars uh, are given uh, 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 assistance, uh, and particularly as far as children are concerned, uh, there are places where the children uh, can be uh, placed in accordance with their uh, social situation. Thank you. In response to Article uh, 20 concerning uh, conversion from Islam to another religion, I think Dr. Mohammed, you will uh, you will give us some please uh, answers about that point. As uh, question 20 is concerned, we have uh, given an answer to this uh, question. There are no Muslims. There are no non-Muslims who have uh, received uh, the uh, Kuwaiti nationality as far as the nationality law is concerned. But those who, who change from Islam and who also give up their nationality, the Kuwaitis uh, cannot uh, change uh, their, their religion. There are no withdrawal of nationality from a Kuwaiti citizen who has changed his religion from Islam to another one. Thank you. Pertaining to question number 21 about the places of worship and uh, inquiry about that particular thing, you see. So, I'll give uh, Mr. Mutlak, he's from the Ministry of Awqaf and Sharia, he will uh, he'll give an answer about that. Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim In the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate, as far as uh, places of worship are concerned, the uh, uh, difficulties they face, uh, I would like to say that uh, the uh, permits uh, provided uh, for places of worship are seven churches, seven churches. The number of places of worship licensed regarding the question on the number of places of worship uh, officially licensed by the government there are seven uh, churches uh, roman catholic uh, anglican and evangelical and uh, uh, greek orthodox uh, Armenian Orthodox, uh, Coptic Orthodox, and uh, Catholic Armenian. These are the seven churches that are licensed by Kuwait 
to carry out uh, the worship, uh, their traditional uh, exercise of the religion. As far as uh, visas uh, for uh, men of religion are concerned, these are subject uh, to the laws uh, implemented by the Ministry of the Interior, the Ministry of Social Affairs, uh, and these uh, visas are not only uh, uh, regarding any any uh, 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 any church or any place of worship. Uh, it uh, it uh, receives. Uh, uh, those uh, who uh, respond to the laws uh, of the Ministry of the Interior, Minister of Social Affairs, they can receive these visas. As far as other religions are concerned, we would like to affirm that uh, the Constitution of the State of Kuwait in Article 35 has stipulated uh, that the freedom of religion is uh, total and uh, that uh, there are uh, permissions uh, for worship uh, to take place uh, in accordance with the religions, uh, provided that this does not uh, uh, disturb public order or against uh, public morality. The religions that uh, are aligned to these uh, rules and regulations, which uh, do not disturb public order or public morality. These are licensed to carry out their religious rights and in total freedom also. Other than that, the law is applied to them. And therefore, I believe that this question is totally in line with Article 18 of the Covenant which stipulates uh, the following uh, in Article 3. The freedom of, of a person uh, is not uh, restricted in his expression of his religion or uh, beliefs, uh, except uh, as far as the law is concerned in order to take uh, into consideration uh, national peace, uh, public order, or health, uh, or public morality, or the rights of others, uh, and their basic freedoms. Uh, if the practice uh, of uh, religious rights uh, take place uh, within the framework of Article 18 of the Inter International Covenant uh, and uh, Article 35 of uh, the Constitution of Kuwait, then this is accepted uh, legally for us. The difficulties uh, that are sometimes faced uh, for licenses, uh, I would like to say that uh, there are no difficulties. There are Let's say they are bureaucratic procedures, uh, government procedures that are applicable to all places of worship, uh, which need uh, a permit or a license, uh, whether it is uh, from the cabinet, from the Ministry of the Works, or from the municipality, or from the municipal council, or any other government authority which uh, has its word to say as far as the choice of the places uh, where uh, places of worship uh, will be built. Uh, thank you. As well, I'll question number 22 about the non-Muslim pupils. And Dr. Saud, if you can just please. Uh, Try to touch on that one. There were three questions. Uh, as far as this, uh, what is the situation of a uh, non-Muslim in Kuwait? The second question, what uh, are the uh, religious education provided in public and private schools? And third, 
where do non-Muslims learn their religion? The non-Muslim student is not obliged to attend the Islamic uh, education classes. In uh, Article 27, uh, 35, and 12, uh, for the three grades of education, the non-Muslim student, uh, whether he's a Kuwaiti or a non-Kuwaiti, is uh, provided uh, with the uh, education uh, in uh, the Islamic Sharia, and he can also learn the Quran if he wishes, or, or and, uh, we can also who, uh, sit for the exams. However, he is not forced to do that. It depends on what he wants, uh, the student. Uh, if at any time he wishes to withdraw from taking those lessons, uh, and he does not want to sit for their exams, there will be no objection to that. And as far as these two uh, uh, two lessons are concerned, then he will be uh, exempted from them. And he does not have to study Islamic tradition. As far as edu ed uh, 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 religious education is concerned, it is provided in all stages uh, of uh, education. These uh, schools, the Kuwaiti schools in uh, private uh, education, come to 53,773. In other words, 26% uh, of uh, the uh, private education. And uh, this is due to the fact that the uh, the, the uh, state is obliged to provide uh, Islamic education to all the students. The third question concerning non-Muslims, there are educational places uh, in the churches and also for a certain category, a certain religion to uh, carry out uh, their religious rites and they learn, they are given lessons in their religion uh, through these uh, 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 these uh, places of worship or through their own uh, community. Thank you. And, uh, Your Excellency, I think uh, in order not to put uh, time uh, pressure on you, we will allow you to take as much time as you can to answer the rest of the questions. So if we extend beyond one hour, that is completely all right for us. Thank you. Twenty-three. Concerning, there were questions pertaining to question number twenty-three, and question pertaining to twenty-four. Uh, the Attorney General, he might uh, answer that that question. Shukran. So I'm going to tell them. Thank, thank you. I shall speak on, on this matter about the uh, right of expression and the question uh, of uh, 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 touching upon the reputation of somebody and uh, the media. The Article 36 in the uh, Kuwaiti Constitution gives, uh, provides uh, freedom of expression and to disseminate it either by word or by writing or any other means. Article 37 also provides for the freedom of, uh, uh, the, of the newspapers uh, and uh, of publication. And this uh, freedom is exercised in accordance with the uh, conditions specified by the law and within the public order and public morality. They are like most other rights and uh, basic freedoms. They are limited by the uh, resources of the country and it's belief that uh, rights and freedoms uh, are carried out within uh, these, uh, framework, this framework. There are many 
different crimes according to the law with regard to the law on publications and publishing and the law on <coughs> audiovisual information media despite the fact that both laws have imported in the two articles of the Constitution by uh, uh, applying these freedoms. And the number of cases in front of the courts is due to the fact that these laws have two kinds of crimes. The first part concerns the violation of regulatory laws and the conditions of the publication of a newspaper and others concerning what happened, the religious writings, if there are any uh, were, or if there's any text uh, that might uh, cons uh, uh, deal with uh, Islam or with uh, the Islamic uh, traditions, and also the personality of the ruler of the country. And there is another part related to the uh, security aspect, such as uh, communications, uh, conventions and treaties uh, and another part also deals with the jurisprudence uh, part uh, which prohibits uh, any insult or violation of uh, the members of the judiciary or of the prosecution and uh, the and which reveal uh, the secrecy of uh, uh, fact-finding or investigation, investigatory practices. Uh, there is also a part of dealing with uh, any writings uh, that uh, uh, touch upon the private life of uh, people and their dignity, as well as public uh, morality, and those which deal with the economy by publishing news that could affect the currency, the value of the currency, or could uh, disrupt the economy of the country. The second part, uh, which, uh, on which questions have been posed, <coughs> regarding the information uh, cases, they, in fact, are a violation of the private uh, life of uh, individuals and the reputation of people because uh, they constitute insult or humiliation. However, the law stipulates uh, that uh, these uh, acts uh, are permissible if uh, it, they are true and if the court decides that the public good requires that they be disseminated, and if there is uh, no ill will on the part of uh, the person who has uh, spread this defamation, and that he has done so out of his belief that this is for the good of the people. And in the fact that what he is doing is defending the public good of the country and limiting it, what he has said, to the necessary limits of protecting the public good. Uh, as far as uh, these uh, data are concerned, there were respect of the privacy of communications, 
the uh, Constitution has uh, provided for the freedom of communication in Article 39, which comprises uh, the, the freedom of exchange of letters, uh, of telegrams, of phone calls. And what you mean here by messages is all that uh, this article has uh, referred to as means of communication. Undoubtedly, that uh, the, uh, the great development in means of communication and the use of satellites and cable networks has allowed some to listen in to private conversations and to record them and to use them to uh, to uh, either blackmail them or, or insult them. And therefore, there was a law for the misuse of uh, all means of communication and all means of uh, hacking into these conversations for those who misuse these uh, these instruments deliberately and if this use constitutes a disturbance uh, through the use uh, of obscene language uh, or shameful language uh, or if it constitutes uh, uh, an encouragement uh, to uh, uh, ill behavior or to a threat to life or to honor or to money. The second article of the same law has prohibited the uh, exchange uh, of all means of hacking on these uh, uh, communication or selling them without the uh, without uh, uh, private without uh, receiving uh, the uh, agreement of the prosec prosecution uh, for this uh, and uh, in these cases uh, this equipment is uh, immediately seized as regards the use of the internet there are no limitations on this use and the use of the internet requires no permission or consent of any uh, quarter whatsoever or government uh, office. As far as the sites on the internet are concerned, they are available as uh, these sites are available on the internet with the exception of uh, pornographic sites or e religious extremism sites that uh, violate uh, the uh, uh, public order in the state. Thank you. Frankly, I will, uh, before, because it was in my mind, but uh, but I will jump to it. It's uh, to answer Article 35. Uh, probably there is misunderstanding in our perceptions of what uh, has said concerning ethnics in Kuwait. We were thinking about whether the Kuwaitis themselves, but as you have explained to me that other than not the Kuwaitis themselves, but uh, other uh, groups live in Kuwait itself. And I think uh, I have two people who will answer. Iman, you will answer the section, who are they? And Dr. Mohammed, you will answer about their, their what, what we, uh, what we do for them. Iman. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Shukran, Saad al-Rais. Bin-nisba lil-sukkan al-wafidin, fa-tumathil nisbatuhum 
من جملة السكان of all of the citizens who are not Kuwaiti, non-Kuwaiti residents. The, these are the following nationalities who are there, Indians, Egyptians, uh, Bengalis, Syrians, Pakistanis, Saudi Arabians, uh, Filipinos, and people from Sri Lanka. We also have other nationalities. We have three other nationalities who are of equal numbers. They add up to the same number as um, actual Kuwaiti people. These are the Indians who are around 25% of the entire migrant population. There are 611 uh, 381 of them. They are followed by Egyptians who are 16% of the non-Kuwaiti population. There are 449, 571,000 of them. The third is the Egyptians and uh, people of uh, Bengal origin who are around 9% of the population. There are 216, uh, 450,000 of them. Thank you. As regards the issue of practices, and the practicing of traditional culture and religious um, traditions for this foreign community. We have some statistics regarding festivals which have been organized in Kuwait. A, a charitable event was organized for Indians from in Karana on the 26th of August 2010. A festival was organised for the Egyptian Copts on 10th of December 2010. A Christmas and New Year um, celebration was organised for Egyptian Copts. This celebration was organised in the Coptic Catholic Church of Kuwait. on the 31st of December 2010 and also on the 1st of January 2011. The Copt community also celebrated Christmas Eve on the 16th and 17th of April uh, 2011. There was a celebration for the anniversary of a sultan who um, carried out a historic um, event in March 2011. A celebration was organised for the visit of a foreign sultan. This was organised on the 16th. of January 2006. The majority of foreign communities celebrate their national holidays freely. This is done in public places. This is practiced in all free, in complete freedom without any restriction. Thank you. <laughs> I would like uh, 
Zakaria from Ministry of Justice to answer, to answer the question of, of 31. And also, he will touch upon yesterday a question about uh, uh, whether foreigners then can acquire a, a real estate in Kuwait. He will also touch on that subject, I think, because that question we did not really uh, answer it yesterday. He might uh, help us in that thing. 31 plus uh, whether they can have uh, you know, real estate in Kuwait. Shukran Saad Safir. Thank you, Your Excellencies, Ambassadors, Madam Chair. Thank you, members of the committee. As regards the question which was raised regarding the age of marriage and what hindrances there are, to respond to this question, we must look over the le legislative text covering marriageable age. The law regarding uh, persons does not have a precise minimum age for marriage, but Article 26 of this uh, law of 1994 says that a marriage contract must be obtained when the bride is 15 or under and when the and the groom must be at least 17 years old when signing the con marriage contract this is one of the measures which fixes the age of marriage direct directly because so it is banned for young girls under 15 to enter into marriage. Apologies. May I explain again? <laughs> Actually, the, the personal status law have specified in his, in the Article 26, the limitation of the uh, age of the girl as 15 years old and for the boy 17 years old. So that authentication can be made by the Ministry of Justice of this marriage. As it was asked by the uh, member of uh, this committee, what is the, uh, the procedures or for limitation of the process of uh, the marriage of uh, less than 15 years old for girls? Actually, one of those uh, 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 procedures that there is no way that this marriage can be authenticated by uh, the Department of Justice unless that the girl should be 15 and 17 for the boy. Actually, uh, I want to discuss this matter more broadly with the uh, perspective of the Child Right of Child Convention that in article uh, number one, for the purposes of this agreement, the child should be less than 18 years old. Actually, uh, it was carried out with a, a, a sentence also in this article. So uh, I think maybe you are well aware that the laws have to specify maybe the majority age comes before 18. So this is recognized by, by all the state uh, party in this convention. Uh, also, I have to mention the articles in the rights of child concerning article 14, which uh, specifies, I may read it in Arabic here, كَمَا تُقَرِّرْ بِحُقُوقِ وَمَسْؤُولِيَاتِ to define the role of the parents in various parts of the convention. And therefore, on the basis of this, it is clear that the establishment or drafting of the contract of marriage and to legalise this marriage, the 
girl must be 15 and the boy must be 17. Uh, sir, as I said, um, the situation is changing and we must allow time for this. If we look at what has been happening over the past 10 years and if we look at the statistics, we will find that spouses, uh, sorry, brides under uh, 15 due to statistics we have from the Ministry of Religious Affairs مقابل زواجها من كويتي هم ثلاث حالات اوكي اي ابولوجيز انا اسف استمر بالعربيه اي شول كونتينيو ان عربيك سيز ذا سبيكر in the statistics that we have, and which I have given to the members of the committee, it is clear that the cases of girls who are under 15 years is in fact quite rare if we compare with the last 10 years. Thank you. I'm sorry, I'm just going to respond to the second question, if you will allow me. As regards the following issue, the question on paragraph 64 of the report which was submitted to this distinguished committee. Firstly, we would like to highlight that the situation in the state of the Kuwait, given the size of the state of Kuwait and given the land area which is habitable that we have in our possession, all of this means that we must recall that we need to use international law. International law does not have uniform rules for all states across the world and therefore this article is not stable and the situation is changing. Mr Frentiman said to us that in the report there is a discrimination between um, Kuwaiti people and foreigners regarding real estate. The Kuwaiti constitution has adopted as a general principle, a general principle which allows for the complete respect of foreigners' rights. They are equal with Kuwaiti people. The issue of national privilege given to Kuwaitis on the basis of their Kuwaiti citizenship, well, this is part of private law. We have particular rules which organise property and the, the owning of real estate by foreigners. The current practice is based on law number one. I'm sorry, decree number one. Article 74. Uh, 1999 regarding real estate and its owning ownership by non-Kuwaiti people. It is clear in the text of the law that real estate is limited to Kuwaiti people and this includes enjoying the rights to real estate. Article 3 of the same decree thanks to this text which was amended with uh, in Article 79 and it allows uh, foreign citizens to buy uh, real estate which does not exceed the needs of um, embassies and consulates for the rest. Things are organised by a request submitted to the Ministry of Economic Affairs an Arab citizen can uh, own some 40,000 square metres. 
foreigners through a special committee uh, responsible for reviewing the requests of non-Kuwaiti citizens and non-Arab citizens can do this. And this, um, this committee reviews the possibility of buying property. These are rules which allow property to be bought by non-Kuwaiti people. There was a question raised in the committee about uh, the medical fees where uh, it might represent a burden on the, on the, on the laborers. I would like to give Dr. Uh, Abdelhadi, Ministry of Health, so he can respond and he can give us some information about that. Dr. Abdelhadi. Thank you, Your Excellencies, Ambassadors. Madam Chair, members of the committee. Taxes are imposed on medical services according to Article 1 of the law of 1999. This regards medical insurance for foreigners. In accordance with this article of this law, the amounts paid are fixed. The sum that the foreign um, citizen must pay to the state before that person can reside in the country. It is 50 dinars. This is almost $180 a year, which covers the costs incurred by the Family. The family must pay 40 dinars, that's some $140 a year, and their children uh, pay a certain amount too, it's almost 100 dinars per person per year. This includes uh, coverage through healthcare services, basic uh, healthcare such as um, uh, doctor's appointments and um, care throughout the year. This includes tests, um, x-rays and the medicines which are prescribed. What is not included in this sum, in this are uh, domestic domestic workers who must pay five dinars a year. These are Kuwaiti dinars. This includes health care um, costs, um, health care coverage, which is, um, which is granted to these domestic workers. As regards hospital visits, uh, one must pay two Kuwaiti dinars, that is every foreigner must pay this, it's a kind of tax for hospital services. Uh, hospital care in each district may request a dinar for any uh, hospital visit made. For hospitals, therefore, we must uh, pay six US dollars, and for healthcare centres, three dollars per visit. Uh, the, this does not cover emergency care. The payment of uh, the cost is not demanded in the case of uh, emergencies, whether it's in hospitals or general health care. But, however, there are some e exceptions made on humanitarian grounds. Uh, here are some examples. Children who are not Kuwaiti citizens who have cancer are exempt from any cost or tax for their health care. Those who are on school bursaries uh, foreign students who are studying in Kuwait are exempt from paying these fees. In emergencies, as I've said, uh, travellers in transit who have health care pro health problems when they're inside the airport of uh, Kuwait City are exempt. P 
people who are uh, sh in shelter, such as um, migrant workers, are also exempted. Illegal residents are exempt from all health taxes. Thank you. And look on my cheek. Yeah, I, I think if he speaks a little bit more about the independence of judiciary, it's, it's very important if the Attorney General will explain it a little bit. Uh, ah? Sean? And uh, I'm a daddy. Okay? And, and she will comment on, uh, uh, on question number one, as a matter of fact, whether the covenant, whether, whether it's with our laws, she will comment after that. But judiciary, Khui uh, Saud, and then Saada. Uh, كان هناك تساؤل تكرر أكثر من مرة. There was a question which has been repeated several times as regards the precedence given to the International Covenant uh, as regards national law. Your Excellencies, and we said this morning that as regards we have law number 12 of 1996. This law ensures that these are part an integral part of uh, Kuwaiti law, but this does not prevent our adhesion to this covenant, um, including the res reservations that we have against some of the articles under the covenant, which are in contravention of sh uh, which go against uh, Sharia law. Because, as I said, ambassadors, uh, Sharia law is the only uh, source of law for laws covering uh, family life, such as marriage, divorce and inheritance. So we have some reservations to these articles as regards the rest. Um, we have uh, civil law and all these are considerations been examined by Kuwaiti law. So as we have acceded to the covenant, it has become an integral part of our na Kuwaiti national law. Thank you. فيما يتعلق باستغلال السلطة القضائية. As regards the independence of the judiciary in Kuwait and the um, dependence of courts, the legal system in Kuwait is governed by rules which are then overseen by the emir of the country. The constitution, the Kuwaiti uh, laws, guarantee the principle of the independence of the judiciary. the honour and the integrity of judges. Their justice and their equity are the basis of the system. These are also a safeguard on the, ex on the exercise of freedom and uh, rights. No party has any authority over the judge who is fully free to apply the law. The law guarantees the independence of the judiciary and judges. This is also applicable to the judgments which the judges hand down.
whether these are uh, judgments um, handed down to Kuwaiti citizens or to foreign citizens. All these uh, people whom I've spoken of have immunity on the basis of the Constitution. And everyone respects the separation of powers between the executive and the judiciary. In the Council of Justice, which um, is the chief body in the activity of judges, in cases where the Minister of Justice um, comes to a trial or if there are other uh, specialists who attend the trial or participate in the activities of the court or if um, experts are mixed in. There is um, they have no particular casting vote in the decisions made. Judges are nominated, as well as foreign judges, in accordance with a decree. After taking their oath before His Highness, the Emir of the country, with the aim of ensuring uh, that the laws of the country are respected. Judges can only be excluded from their duties in the framework of disciplinary measures which are set forth under law. These laws can be found in the a disciplinary framework of the judicial authority. Nobody can terminate the contract of foreign judges, no one can terminate the contract of prosecutors, unless there is the agreement of the Supreme Council of Justice. Thank you. Can you please talk about uh, the Egyptian judges and how they are treated? Uh, the law does not uh, distinguish uh, between uh, the Kuwaiti judge uh, or the foreign judge. In fact, uh, We have uh, come to an agreement uh, with uh, the uh, Republic of Egypt uh, to have these their judges seconded uh, to Kuwait. The, uh, these Egyptian judges uh, carry out their duties uh, on a full-time basis. and therefore they are relieved of all their uh, duties in Egypt. Uh, foreign or Kuwaiti uh, judges uh, are only bound by the law of the country and are subject to no other authority. Hajri. In the name of God, the compassionate, the merciful, Madam Chairperson, regarding the detention uh, of uh, persons uh, or uh, holding them in police uh, custody, the police uh, men cannot uh, hold uh, anyone uh, unless uh, an order is issued uh, by the public uh, prosecutor and the general directorate of investigation or unless uh, they have been caught in flagrante delicto and then they can be uh, held uh, in police custody. 
as soon as a person is arrested, he has the right uh, to be represented by counsel. And he is the, as soon as he is arrested, uh, he is referred before a judge of inquiry to investigate the matter. Regarding detention for four days, this is for purely uh, security um, uh, authorities, uh, such as uh, intelligence, uh, the intelligence office that investigate uh, important matters or serious matters, uh, such as uh, drug crimes or other criminal uh, uh, acts. Uh, the uh, of course, the procedures that are adopted are based on the results of the investigation that is carried out uh, by uh, specialized officers, and then they are brought before the public prosecutor. The public prosecutor issues uh, permission or authorization to carry out investigation and to arrest uh, the person in question. No one can be arrested or detained. Uh, unless uh, an order is, is issued either by the general directorate of investigation or the public prosecutor. Any person who is uh, arrested or detained or is investigated by the police um, is uh, uh, protected as uh, these uh, police stations uh, come under inspection to make uh, sure uh, that uh, any person detained has been detained lawfully. Thank you. I think there is a proposal, I think, that uh, to lower it from four days to two days, only to 48 hours, right? Yes, uh, yes, sir, you're quite right. There is a bill which is currently uh, being examined uh, to reduce uh, the detention period uh, for certain uh, security matters uh, to uh, 48 uh, days. The, uh, the bill is under examination. To add something, I think, and that will be our final. Shukran. Thank you. I just wanted uh, to refer uh, to the contribution uh, to the Social Security, which is uh, paid by domestic workers. The employers of domestic workers have to pay this contribution on behalf of the domestic worker. And even uh, those uh, companies who have uh, um, uh, workers uh, also have to pay these uh, Social Security contributions on behalf of those uh, workers uh, in order to alleviate uh, the uh, financial burden for these workers. There was misunderstanding. The proposal, it is 48 hours lowering it from, not days, hours, 48 hours, from four days to 48 hours. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Your Excellency, and members of the delegation. I have two uh, speakers who want to uh, close follow-up questions. Mr. O'Flaherty, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Madam. I'll, I'll be very brief, um, and I'm most grateful for the information and for the clarifications uh, around issues that hadn't been covered in the written responses. Uh, just a few points. Uh, first, um, I, um, I, I listened with interest to the response uh, on the question 20, but uh, unless I missed it, I do not recall the distinguished member of the delegation referring to the specific case of the 27-year-old citizen who was unable to change uh, the stated religion on his birth certificate uh, after he had converted from Islam to Christianity. It would be good, even if in writing, to have a sense of the, um, of the situation in that case. Um, secondly, I, I, I'm very grateful for the information regarding the um, registration of places of worship. That's very helpful indeed. Uh, and it does indeed appear that as a matter of law, there may not be a problem. Uh, however, there does indeed seem to be a problem as a matter of practice, because according to information before us, uh, there is no registered place of worship uh, for Buddhists, for Hindus, or for Sikhs. Uh, and uh, I, again, if this is mistaken, if this is not accurate information, perhaps uh, the distinguished delegation could provide us with a response either now or in writing. 
And thirdly and finally, uh, I listened with interest to the uh, responses regarding issues of freedom of expression. And uh, I find myself having to conclude simply that there's a, a big disjunction between the standards set in Article 19 of the Covenant and the law and practice uh, in the State Party. And again, I, I, I don't wish to repeat what I said earlier today, but I would earnestly encourage the State Party to consider the new general comment, which provides very helpful guidance, guidance which would allow you to do a review of your law and practice uh, in, in a context where, as I, as I believe, there are some very serious problems. Um, let me just recall some key points. Firstly, we have to always keep in mind that restriction of expression should be the exception and not the norm. Secondly, to the extent that restrictions uh, are imposed, they must pass very strict tests of necessity and proportionality. Third, in, in making the assessment of that test, one has to keep in mind that criticism of the head of state is legitimate. Political opposition to the head of state is legitimate. This is very clear in the general comment. Uh, and secondly, uh, blasphemy also uh, must pass a very strict test before it's acceptable under the covenant. Uh, in the general comment, I'll just quote one line because we don't have the time. Uh, the committee adopted the following sentence. Prohibition of displays of lack of respect for a religion, including blasphemy laws, are incompatible with the covenant, except in the specific circumstances of Article 20. And uh, uh, colleagues and the distinguished delegation will recall that the context of Article 20 is incitement of hatred, etc. And so um, there's a very strict test for blasphemy. And finally, and it's my very last point, Madam, um, I, I, I remain very concerned about the litigiousness of private citizens in uh, bringing, private, bringing complaints of uh, inappropriate speech uh, to the courts. Um, this, 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 this climate of bringing complaints, very large number of complaints last year, many of which are upheld, uh, I would suggest has what we describe as a chilling effect for freedom of expression. And I'm no expert and I've no competence to speak to exactly how the Kuwaiti legal system operates. But uh, in the pursuit of compatibility with the covenant, I'd encourage the, um, the State Party to reconsider the extent to which complaints of this nature uh, are received and considered by the courts. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Flaherty. Sir Nigel. Thank you, Madam Chairperson, and very briefly as well, just before the break, a distinguished uh, member of the delegation was responding to the issue of the composition of the judiciary, but then was kind of cut short because of uh, time pressures. Uh, I, I want to be very clear. Um, my question isn't about the judiciary, in fact. My question is about judges. Are there any women judges? If there are, I'd be interested to know the details. If there are not, I'd like to know why, and in particular, what criteria for membership of the judiciary women fail to meet. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Nigel. Would you like your delegation yes, to respond? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, would respond. Uh, I will respond maybe for the two sections which we have raised concerning freedom of information. Concerning uh, this young gentleman of 27, frankly, we debated it today among ourselves and uh, we couldn't get answers very, very. But I'm willing to allow one of my delegations contact you if you have any information where and how or, if you, or who or whatever, we are ready to investigate it. Any, if you have anything or you wanted to send it to me personally without, you know, so we can know exactly how to pursue it. How, how to pursue the, uh, the case. Actually, frankly, today we debated it a lot. We went back again. But I don't know. Maybe we can, we can answer it in the field. Uh, you have raised the issue about uh, too many cases on, in, the, in, the, in the courts now. Frankly, it depends sometimes on the political climates in Kuwait, exactly, on the political discussions and, the, and there are certain groups attacking certain groups and that. But we cannot forbid any Kuwaiti from going to the courts and, and, and you know, asking to, to, you know, to, 
uh, especially sometimes the language which used between the two parties are very, very strong. And sometimes accusation even reaches too many high officials, too many people, and without, it's baseless sometimes. So he has the right, each citizen Kuwaiti, he can go to the court and, and uh, see whether he's right or, or wrong. We do not really, frankly, uh, concerning women judges, I think uh, I will let the Attorney General answer it, but Yeah, and I, I have said it before, maybe you were not here, uh, but I have said clearly that, uh, as we have said it in the, in the UPRs, uh, that we have, we have really, there is, there is no stipulation says no, and there is no stipulation says yes. But when we presented our case in the UPRs, we said we are studying this matter. There is a, there is a debate going on. We have, to, we have to consult with the, uh, the, court, with the Supreme Court of Judges to see how we can present this case. And, and frankly, from the last time in the UPR till now, we are debating this. We're finding the ways and means how to encourage, you know, in the future maybe uh, women judges will be considered. And if I'm not wrong, Mr. Saud, the Attorney General, he might answer you that there are women in different sections, but we haven't not yet reached there, the judges. But we are in that direct, we, we, society is developing in a way that it might, you know, lead in the future towards, you know, uh, judges. But we have to look from different point of views in order to reach, you know, such, such, such a decision. It has to be, you know, discussed with a lot of we have parliaments, we have also parliamentarians, how, how to pass it in parliaments. We have uh, the executive also. But uh, Mr. Saud, you can answer exactly where we're going in that direction. Uh, shukran. Thank you. Many women who have uh, excelled uh, in uh, their careers as lawyers in the private uh, uh, sector or even in the public uh, sector, especially when it comes to Islamic law, and who have excelled uh, in the various uh, de departments uh, or other sectors such as banks and uh, uh, the financial sec uh, sector. are numerous and in fact uh, there are no laws that exp explicitly prevent uh, women from being nominated judges uh, we have uh, women ambassadors we have women ministers and i would like to quote uh, f uh, the the uh, uh, president of the court of appeals and a member of the supreme judiciary judiciary council he said that it is a matter of time it is an, it, it is not a question of limitations or restrictions it is only a matter of time It is a question of tradition, and hopefully we will be able to do away with this tradition, and we, we will soon see women judges in Kuwait. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency. We now uh, would like you to make a closing statement, if you have any. and. Uh, The places of, uh, sorry, but I think the question about, you know, places of worship. About, you know, the places about Buddhism and, and the rest. Can you please, a little bit analyze it, please? غير المسيحيين. Non-Christians. For non-Christians. Mr. 
بالنسبة regarding uh, uh, the Buddhists uh, or the Sikh the law and the constitution does not uh, prevent the Buddhists or the Sikh uh, from uh, practicing their religion however there are certain practices uh, and uh, rituals uh, of the Buddhists or the Sikh are contrary to public morals in, uh, and public order, order in Kuwait. Therefore, they are authorized to practice these rituals in their private homes or in special places. They are not authorized to practice them in public places. as the law prohibits uh, these practices uh, based on the constitution and uh, also based uh, on article 18 of the covenant uh, which uh, uh, stipulates that there should be respect of uh, public morals and public order Question number 20, no, article 20, and then about, you know, uh, the Emir, Doctor, uh, uh, Doctor. There was concern expressed you know, but in, not, you know, uh, by by definition, but rather she is in fatwa and tashri'ah. She is our legal advisor, you see. Uh. Thank you. Uh. There was concern expressed uh, regarding Article uh, 20. Of course, uh, there is a prohibition uh, of incitement uh, to hatred or discrimination uh, or hostility. In addition uh, to the applicable laws uh, in uh, the state of Kuwait, uh, Article uh, Law 3 of uh, 2006 on uh, publications uh, the law stipulates uh, that uh, the uh, defamation uh, of uh, persons or their religions and the incitement uh, to uh, hatred of, or against any group uh, or uh, to expose, expose their uh, personal information on uh, their financial situation which uh, may impair their reputation or their wealth or uh, their uh, uh, commercial pres prestige is prohibited. Uh, this is according to the law on publications. There is also a bill which is presented by the government to the National Assembly. The bill, the bill's title is the Protection of National Unity. The government requested Parliament to examine this uh, bill urgently. And this bill includes a, a prohibition of uh, incitement uh, or a call by any means whatsoever The incitement to hatred against uh, any uh, community in the Kuwaiti society or uh, anything that uh, may harm the national unity or cause uh, uh, sectarianism or tribalism or sedition 
or cause the spread of ideas of a supremacy of one race, color, or religion, or sex over any other group. This bill, in fact, covers Article 20 of the Covenant. Article 19 of the Covenant mentions freedom of expression and opinion. In paragraph 3, the covenant uh, mentions that these uh, rights uh, mentioned in paragraph uh, 2 of the present article entail special duties and responsibilities. Uh, and therefore can be subject to certain restrictions provided that these restrictions are in accordance with the law. And these restrictions in Kuwait have been um, stipulated for uh, by in in a law and not uh, by decree and these restrictions uh, are in con full conformity with the uh, government uh, covenant uh, certain there are certain restrictions imposed on freedom of expression however these restrictions uh, uh, must be as provided for by the law and necessary and must be in full conformity with the law on publications uh, as well as uh, the law on audiovisual uh, media. Therefore, there are two conditions mentioned in the covenant. Uh, respect uh, for the dignity of others uh, and uh, protection of their reputation. No one can freely express his opinion if that opinion is harmful to the reputation of uh, uh, another person. As uh, to the standard of necessity, uh, these are confined to public health, uh, public order, public morals, and national unity. And these are the only conditions uh, that govern freedom of expression and the uh, law on publications. Public order is uh, a, a phrase whose meaning may change from one country to the other. What is uh, considered public order in one state uh, c may not be considered uh, public order in another state, and therefore there are certain uh, matters that may be permitted in certain countries and others may not. Thank you. What uh, the for you? One of the experts also expressed concern regarding the Les Majesté. Uh, we uh, uh, have to say that this is a, a, a rule enshrined in the Constitution. It was agreed upon between the ruler and the people. 
There is also an, another article in the Constitution uh, which uh, prevents uh, the Emir from carrying out any political activities, but carries out uh, his activities uh, through the ministers. Therefore, he has no political duties in order to avoid any les majesté. Therefore, the, cons uh, the Constitution and the, uh, the, the laws in Kuwait, uh, in Kuwait are indivisible, and they have to be applied together. Thank you. Thank you. Floor, Thank you, Madam Chairman. Madam Chairman, I would like to express my appreciation to you personally and to the distinguished experts for giving us the time. And you gave us plenty of time to, to try to answer and try to. And let me assure you that uh, we consider the covenant is, is part of Kuwaiti law. We consider that. But however, we have aspects of Sharia Islamia, for instance, and then we said exactly where certain things in Sharia that we are abiding by it in according to, uh, to those things. But we do abide by the covenants. We do abide by our international treaties Definitely, they have a supremacy over the, uh, our national laws. But also, at the same time, when Kuwait came as constitutional monarchies in the 60s, when it was protected under the British, we came different laws during that time and new laws right now. And it's not easy, not easy to correct laws or to try to adapt them. You can present laws, but it takes very long process from the, from the legislative party, from the executive party to, 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 to go through the legislative party, to approve it through different channels. So it is, frankly, takes process. It's not easy. You can decide that one. And will take a lot of debate. It will take a lot of, uh, but, we do whatever is necessary to abide by our obligation in terms of international law. That I tell you for sure. And let's hope in the future we will have a judge, woman judge among ourselves. <laughs> I mean, so as I tell you, I thank you again. I thank the Secretariat, I do thank the interpreters, and thank everybody. I think we appreciate what you have done, and I assure you that we will look very closely to your comments, and we we'll try to convey them to the governments and to see exactly what we can do in order that we can, ob we can abide by our obligations in terms of international law. Thank you, Your Excellency. For my part, I want to express the committee's appreciation to the state of Kuwait for its commitment to fulfill its uh, international obligations. And I want to thank the delegation for your patience and your very uh, clear answers to our questions. It's encouraging, Your Excellency, to note that uh, various policy advancements have been made in Kuwait, but uh, I want to emphasize what has been said already, that national laws must not only comply with international standards, but that no other legal framework should supersede Kuwait's obligations under the covenant. We've covered a lot of ground, and I'm sure we're all very tired. I can see the faces of the distinguished members of the delegation. And so I will not go over, uh, over the various uh, areas of concern, save to say that we will uh, send you concluding observations as uh, a conclusion to today's uh, set of, di uh, of, to this dialogue today, and hope that uh, you will uh, not take so long to uh, produce the third periodic report okay. of <laughs> Kuwait.
Okay. This concludes the consideration of uh, the second periodic report of uh, the State of Kuwait. I shall allow the delegation to uh, take leave of us, but uh, obviously um, members of the committee will um, continue with the meeting afterwards. And of course the public will also uh, leave because this is going to be a private meeting now. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. Thank you very much. Sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you, Thank you very much. To, the, to our near judge, I gave a copy.